There's seven components of force that influence the behavior of connective tissues. Let's just talk about a few of them. Good morning. Happy Monday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. So very exciting. New hats arrived over the weekend. So I'm off to a great start on a Monday. Um, we had a bunch of discussions on IFSU. Actually, it's an ongoing discussion on IFS University um, in regards to yielding and overcoming behaviors of the connective tissue. So I thought, so I would lean into that one a little bit and, and flesh out some, some issues. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's capable of influencing the behavior of the connective tissues. One of the things that we want to start to, to recognize um, is the, the, this is something that the nervous system is not involved with, and it's, it's actually important that it's not. The nervous system's a little too slow in, in many of our movement behaviors, and so we have to rely on the behavior of connective tissues, and, and so the connective tissues are viscoelastic, so they alter their stiffness and behaviors based on, on these seven components of, of force. So we've got magnitude, location, direction, duration, frequency, variability, and rate, all influencing um, this connective tissue behavior and so um, because the, the viscoelastic tissues behave as they do, they, they smooth out movement, um, they deform based on, on their inherent stiffness and, and how much energy is stored and released um, will also amplify and dampen movement. And so if you've ever read anything that's associated with like stretch shortening cycle, you'll get an idea of how some of the tissues behave, but we want to th start thinking about all of these tissues um, behaving the same way. And like I said, it's going to be based on degrees of, the, of their inherent stiffness. So I got a couple of examples here. So I got a couple of a uh, couple of bands. I think these are from Elite. If you guys need to get some bands, they're Elite FTS. Um, but you can see the difference in stiffness in the two bands. And so both of them are are deformable. The the thicker band is going to take a lot more force to deform but it's also going to release a lot more energy than this band, but this one actually can, can move quicker. Um, so we have to kind of look at, at how all of these tissues uh, behave and we can influence them differently based on the, the context um, in which we are applying forces. And so let's talk about um, the influence the, or the combined influence, if we will, about uh, magnitude, location and duration. So we don't talk about duration a lot. I talk about rate a lot because I think it's very easy to see. And then I've got this really cool little representation with my silly putty that I've done a bunch of times on some videos. And silly putty is viscoelastic, so it's a nice little representation. So when I pull on this gradually and I get this nice little elongation, um, but if I pull on it, very, very quickly, then of course I get it to snap. So, so this behavior of this tissue is good, a good representation um, of how the stiffness can be altered. So when we think about the magnitude of the load, so the magnitude of the load is going to cause more deformation of, of tissues. And it, it, depending on where we apply the magnitude of load, those tissues are gonna respond. So it's gonna be very contextual. Um, so for instance, if I need to deform bone versus say fascia or a tendon, it's gonna take a lot more load or force applied um, to, to get this tissue to, to deform. So I can actually target the skeleton under, sever, un, under many circumstances, I should say. And, and so we'll, we'll talk about here in, in just a minute. Um, if I think about duration, the longer I apply a load to a, a connective tissue, I will get a stress relaxation response. And so I can actually promote more of a yielding action, if you will. And so if we look at a couple of examples, if I took an overcoming static squat, so what we're, we're seeing here is a squat where we're pushing up into the pins. So the, the rate of loading is very, very quick. So I'm promoting a lot of stiffness through the system. The force application, because it's a maximal effort up into the pins, the force is very, very high and the duration, because of the, the effort involved, the duration is going to be short. So, so my connective tissues are behaving in a stiffer manner, which would be primarily an overcoming bias. So the action of those tissues is biased towards overcoming. Now, 
if I change the context. So now I'm gonna move into a yielding static position in the squat. What I will have is an initial loading rate will be very, very similar to the, to the uh, overcoming, but because the duration um, is a little bit longer, so I'm, I'm dealing with a little bit less load here, um, I can do this over a number of repetitions and I can extend the duration of the exposure to the connect connective tissues, <clears throat> excuse me, so I'll get more of a yielding action. So I'm actually teaching the connective tissues to store more energy. And so if you look at the uh, tendinopathy research where they're talking about extended isometric protocols to, to in increase the amount of load on the tendon, you'll see this stress relaxation response and you'll see how this yielding strategy um, will evolve. Um, the box squat provides us another element where we can, we can redirect the, the load to a specific location. So if I'm looking at a box squat and I'm actually deloading my weight onto the box, I'm actually reducing the amount of muscle activity that I'm using. And so what I'm actually doing is like I'm, I, I'm actually distributing that load now um, to the connective tissues, including the skeleton, which is very, very important, especially for your big, strong power lifters or your offensive linemen, et cetera, et cetera, that need these, these high force components where we need to, to load the skeleton and release that energy for the highest forces possible. And so when we deload to the box, that's how we can direct the load towards very specific um, elements of, of the connective tissue system. And so we get a yielding strategy through the skeleton. Now, we gotta really be careful with loads as far as how we're doing this. And so this is one of the reasons why you might see the difference in, in the loading strategies for, for box squats depending on the qualification of a lifter. And so a, a less qualified lifter will use a higher percentage of their 1RM in, in a box squat to create this yielding strategy because they need more energy, they, a certain amount of energy, I should say, to deform the skeleton. And so it's just a higher percentage of their 1RM. As you get stronger and stronger and stronger, that percentage drops because I only need so much load to deform the skeleton. If I, if I increase the load too much, I deform the skeleton and too much, I create too much of yielding strategy and I don't get any recoil off the box. And so I lose that element of, of explosiveness where I can store a lot of energy, but I can't release it un unless I use the, the optimal load. That's why you see the percentages going down. So again, for a less qualified lifter, maybe it's 70% of one RM on the box squat. For a very high qualified lifter, it might be 45 to 55% of one RM. Um, I would go to Louis Simmons uh, West Side um, uh, articles on this because again, a brilliant strategy. They did it through observation. Um, but I, I think that we can actually look at this through the connective tissue behaviors as far as strategy is concerned. So I hope that gives you a little bit of information or a little bit of an understanding about this yield and overcoming action in regards to the connective tissues. If I didn't answer a question for you, or if you want to go deeper than this, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and I will see you guys tomorrow.